Yeah. Alicia? Yeah, 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 I'm still here. Sorry, I'm just trying to figure this out. Okay, no, no. It, it, so we, we don't need to go out and call. Good afternoon or good morning, everybody. Sorry for the delay on our end. And welcome to the webcast on WIN, Market Update and Outlook in the Americas. Um, this web webcast is part of a series of webcasts as GWEC releases its 2019 annual data by region in the lead up to the publishing of the Global Wind Report on the 25th of March. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping rules. When you join today's webcast, you selected to join either by phone call or computer audio. If for any reason you'd like to change your selection, you can do through, so through your audio pane in your control panel. Throughout today's webcast, you can submit text questions to the speakers by typing them into the questions pane of the control panel. You can send in your questions at any time. We'll collect them and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. If we don't get time to answer your question during the webcast, we will follow it up by email afterwards. The presentations you'll see today are available for download. Uh, you may download them anytime during the webcast. If you have issues downloading the handout, please try opening the link in a different browser or contact um, GWAC directly at info at gwac.net and we'll send you the presentation. I'd like to first kick off our, our first speaker, Emerson Clark, um, the Growth and Partnerships Director at GWAC, who will provide an overview of the 2019 data um, in the Americas region. Good morning and good afternoon. Yep. Good. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone that from uh, listening from all over the world and especially in uh, in the Americas. I'm a new member of the GWEC team, and it's a pleasure to present some of the hard facts and figures from the last year. Um, before handing it off to our experts for some more detailed insights later on in the presentation. So, 2019, given a view, obviously the end of a of a decade that uh, has seen quite a lot of progress and and some ups and downs, but um, still we see it as a solid year. As we all know, the Americas are very different markets in terms of maturity and size. And having said that, 2019 was not the year of the most balanced growth, as we can see from the pie chart. Still, USA, driven largely by the um, extension in the uh, product tax credits, accounted for 68% itself at 9,143 megawatts. And the next three big markets, Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, coming in respectively at 1,281, Argentina 931, Brazil at 745 megawatts, and the remaining at 1,326. Now, it's worth mentioning that the uh, US, Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil accounted for 90% of this new installed capacity. So, um, uh, but there were some other honorable mentions as well. Uh, Chile with uh, 526 megawatts, Canada with the 597 and the Dominican Republic experiencing um, more than double uh, its installed capacity coming on stream this year with 102 megawatts. Great, so I think with this slide, it's a key highlight here is consistent growth year on year, which obviously sends a good message as, as an industry. Although, as we know, delving into the numbers, as we saw in the last slide, does show strong growth in the USA and a slight decrease for Central, South America, and Caribbean. So consistent growth, as I mentioned, 12% both in 2018 and 2019, and encouragingly an 18% growth um, on, on top of last year for Canada, but mainly in the US for this year. And you, as I mentioned, 5% uh, new capacity additions um, it was a decrease um, still in the context of a, of a year of growth for Central South America and the Caribbean. As we know, um, there's some regulatory and political instability in key Latin American markets. There's wind power along with the US-China trade war uh, will be some major challenges coming up, but um, we'll be able to delve further into that at, uh, with my colleagues as they uh, go into further detail as to how we expect that to um, affect forecasts. Well, 2019 ends a year of, um, ends a whole decade of significant progress, and it's very encouraging to see that wind power capacity has tripled in the Americas in the past decade. As, uh, as we all know, wind and solar have, have experienced a bit of a coming of age, and they've matured over the last decade with significant progress, key areas such as market design, supply chain, and price, you know, some, some, key, um, some key milestones, some um, uh, Chile's landmark auction for renewable energy beat fossil fuels on a level playing field. Climate goals beginning to drive policy. 
um, and uh, supply chain development beginning to uh, to occur in a lot of key markets. But of course, there's a lot more work to be done, especially in light of the headwinds that uh, we I mentioned on my last slide and that we'll go into a bit further. But as um, interestingly, GWAC forecasts more steady growth of 72 gigawatts going forward um, over between 2020 and 24, bringing us up to 220 gigawatts. The industry has found ways to keep moving and um, we're confident this will continue to happen. So without further ado, I will pass it on to my colleague Ramon Fiestas. Thanks, Emerson, for providing that overview of uh, 2019. Uh, I'll now hand it off to Ramon Fiestas, who is the chair of GWEC's Latin America Committee. Uh, he'll provide a more in-depth, deep dive into um, some key markets in, in Latin America and what are the challenges and opportunities we see uh, in the future for these markets. Over to you, Ramon. Thanks, Alicia. Thanks, Amazon. Welcome to everybody to the webcast. Yes, uh, Latin America has again, uh, I would say, a very good year because uh, the install capacity in uh, 2019 is it was uh, very, very close to what it was in 2018. So probably uh, less than 100 megawatts. Uh, uh, lower than in, in 2018. This makes a very slow uh, reduction or decrease about 2.8%, uh, something like that, uh, in between both years. So uh, what we see is um, a, a region that is uh, growing steadily um, uh, in terms of, uh, I would say, in terms of the big picture when we look into the region as a whole. But when we see the different markets, uh, the, the picture is completely different. So um, we will uh, come a little bit later into in detail what is happening in, in, in each of the market. But here we, 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 we see something that uh, for the first time in, uh, I would say, in the history of wind power in, in, in Latin America, Brazil is not leading the uh, install capacity in, in, the, the, in the year. Uh, it was taken over by Mexico with 1.6 gigawatts in, in 2019. Uh, this is something that uh, it was somehow expected uh, because of the slowdown that we could see uh, related to what was happening uh, in the past with the auctions in Brazil. So uh, as everybody knows, uh, the Brazilian market is very linked to, to the auction system. And uh, two, three years ago, uh, there was a, a slowdown and a stop of, of, of the auction processes. So uh, we have been forecasting uh, this effect for this year and probably a little bit more as well for the, for the next year. So Mexico was the, is the number one in 2019 with uh, 1.6 gigawatts. Then Argentina uh, is also, uh, in 2019, was also a very steady growth market with uh, close to one gigawatt, 930, something like that, of, of, of uh, megawatts in, in, in the country. This is more than double that, um, that they, they, they installed in, in 2018. Um, all this um, generation capacity was uh, installed in the framework of the Renovar program as well as uh, in the Matter uh, program. This is uh, the Matter uh, ambient, this is the, the free market ambient in, in, in Argentina. Brazil with uh, 745 megawatts is in the third position. Uh, Chile, with over 500 megawatts is in the fourth uh, position. This is also to mention because we look into Chile as a very steady and growing market over the years. And Republica Dominicana as the rising star this year, um, uh, putting aside what happened last year with Peru and this time was Republica Dominicana who came out with close to 200 megawatts in in, in, in install capacity this year. So the rest of Latin America is uh, really not much. It's 1% of the total install capacity this year. 
and it is is uh, something in Costa Rica uh, and as well something more in a uh, very few megawatts in 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 Uruguay this is what we have accounted for for this year in in uh, in in the re in Latin America region so in terms of total installed capacity and accumulated installed capacity of course Brazil is keeping the first uh, the leading position with more than double uh, than Mexico is, is uh, more than half the market in Latin America is is belonging to Brazil with 53% uh, of of the market we are close to to 30 gigawatts in in in, in the region um, I would like to highlight that this this figure is in between what we forecasted in 2010 for the uh, moderate uh, scenario and the accelerate scenario. So we are in between both. This means that in 2020, uh, if things are going are running in the same direction, probably we will be very, very close to what we expected uh, as the accelerated scenario in 2010. So uh, we we would see very, very good, uh, let's say, figures and, and, and good news for, for wind power. And uh, the second market here in, in, in the region is, is Mexico with 21%. And then uh, we can see Chile with a 7% and Argentina, Uruguay are both with both markets with a 5% of course with completely different trends it's very difficult to see much more wind power in uruguay as the electricity system is already um, full with uh, let's say with, with uh, wind power uh, more than 30 percent of, of the uh, energy production in the country is coming from wind power and the electricity system is probably in his limit of of variable energy sources at that stage so uh, different solutions needs to be put in place to to see um, uh, an, uh, an increase of, of wind power in, 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 in Uruguay. And Argentina has, uh, we, we will come later on what is happening there, but, but of course the trend is completely different as well as, as the Uruguayan one. And the rest of Latin America is 8%, I would say, mostly in Central America, which is also well moving this year in, 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 in some of the smaller markets there is, is taking some, some leading in, in Panama as well as in, in Costa Rica. So um, if we go to the next slide, Alisa, we see how uh, this is, uh, I would like to highlight here that uh, the growth after 2012-13 is a very steady uh, growth in what we can um, call major markets for wind power in the region. This is mostly Brazil, Mexico, Chile, and uh, if we look into Argentina and Peru as well uh, in the past, uh, we could see some, 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 some maturity in those markets. So I would say if, if, if we see that uh, since uh, year 2015, the, the, the growth is over 3,000 megawatts every year steadily. We, we see that um, this should be the trend of the market in, 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 in the next year. We see that uh, when in Latin America, one market is slowing down, um, some country is uh, coming up and is balancing the total amount of of wind power in, in the region, and this makes uh, the growth steady, steady uh, from a regional perspective, but unsteadily from, a, let's say, a local or a country perspective. This is uh, something that it, 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 it's common in, in what we are uh, seeing in the Latin American markets. So uh, more than 29% of, of uh, compound average growth rate since uh, 2013. This means, uh, I would say, a, a wealthy uh, growth of, of, of the industry in, 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 in the region. If we go into the next, uh, Alicia. Yeah, what is to highlight in, in the region? 
I would say Brazil, uh, as I as I showed before, is the main driver of the Latin American market, with a huge difference uh, with the other countries, more than fifty percent. That is, say, of, of of the install capacities belonging to Brazil. But Brazil this year has suffered a slowdown um, uh, because of the different policies put in place two years ago and three years ago in regard to stopping the auction process that uh, were uh, closely linked to the economic crisis in, in, in Brazil. The good news is that um, for the next year, Brazil is uh, recovering the growth trend. Uh, as uh, the, in 2019, two different tenders have been launched in, in the country and has awarded over 1,000 megawatts. So the pipeline is uh, being fitted again with, uh, let's say, wealthy uh, projects that are going to to keep on track the Brazilian the Brazilian market in the next year. We are not uh, sure about what is happening in the next year exactly because we think that probably um, we, we, we will also see some kind of effect coming from the past, uh, from the stopping, uh, the auction stopping, but we see as well um, a wealthy recovery uh, of the Brazilian market-based project. So um, I would say this is uh, the first country or, or, or the largest country in, in, in seeing um, private PPAs and uh, private pro uh, uh, projects that are being developed under non-regulated schemes. And this is uh, probably the best news for wind power in, in, in terms of looking into the big picture of the region. If um, this uh, kind of or this sort of, 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 um, of growth uh, is as well uh, occurring in, in, in the other countries in, when the markets are prepared for entering in this kind of, of uh, market development. In, in, well, uh, in, in regard Mexico, Despite this was the best year uh, of uh, wind power for Mexico in his history, um, the bad news is that um, with the political changes happening last year, uh, actually the market is, um, I would say, is seated by a, a huge um, uncertainty in regard what is going to happen in regard the rules that are uh, put in place for wind power developments. We have seen certain um, political measures and regulatory uh, decisions that are driven into retroactive uh, decisions for the industry that are probably not the best uh, news for the industry in terms of, of um, asking or looking for stable markets and stable Framework, frameworks in order to, to deploy the investments. I am um, referring to the decisions that stopped uh, the, the, the tenders for, for the transmission lines in um, Oaxaca as well in Baja California that should increase the, um, the strength of the electricity system. This is one of the biggest barriers there now. And of course, the um, uh, reversing of the of the uh, real energy auctions that was uh, announced in 2018 and was not run in 2019. Uh, these two um, measures has uh, strongly um, impacted the market in terms of um, stopping the project pipeline as it was uh, growing in the past year through through this uh, tender scheme. And um, additionally, recently, some um, regulatory measures um, affecting the, um, the, carbon, the, 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 the carbon credits in, in Mexico has as well driven into much more uh, regulatory instability and uncertainty. And uh, today, the investment 
uh, environment is probably not the best in, in Mexico. Some things similar, but with a completely different um, origin is happening in, in Argentina, where um, the program put in place by the former government of President Macri has worked uh, in a very proper way in terms of uh, allocating um, more than uh, 3,000, close to 3,000 megawatts of, of wind power in the pipeline, of which um, half of them are already um, oper in operation or under, uh, under construction. But the bad news in this case is that um, the political uh, change in Argentina um, is driven as well into a uncertainty in regard what is uh, going to happen with the existing project pipeline and if it is going to be uh, next uh, tender or uh, next regulatory measures in order to keep the pipeline growing. So this is something that um, today is, is uh, uncertain. It's not clear uh, what is going to be the policy of the new government for renewable energies, um, especially for grid connected renewable energies. And uh, what we know for sure is that the investment uh, environment uh, in the Argentinian economy is uh, suffering probably one of the worst uh, moments in his history again. So um, the, the outlook or the insight for, for Argentina for the next uh, year uh, is as well um, somehow um, um, pointed out with a warning and we need to keep an eye on what is going to happen in, in, this, in, the, in both markets in terms of new policy, policy uh, measures or regulatory um, or regulatory tools in order to to keep uh, the industry growing there. Uh, in regard to other markets, I would say um, that as it is common in the region, when one market is slowing down, another market is rising up, and this is happening. Uh, uh, this is happening again in 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 the region with the Colombian market. So the good news is that uh, if the next year Mexico and Argentina will not show very good figures, um, uh, probably Colombia is going to start uh, to become a, a, as well as a, a really a market with the allocation of uh, more than two gigawatts uh, in, in both tenders. I mean, the tender for long-term long -term contracts um, for renewable energies, as well as the as the other tender uh, holder before this one, in order to pr provide um, uh, complementary services in, in 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 the electricity system. So, and there is as well some some other projects that are being developed in a, in a free market a, a environment. So uh, we see that. Colombia is now working in in the way of of putting in operation more than uh, two gigawatts of of wind power, and this is probably happening in in the next two years. So um, we see a rising market in in a new rising market in in Argentina, in, sorry, in 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 the central in the Latin America region with with Colombia, and. Uh, I would say Uruguay is, as I, I was saying before, um, with two megawatts in addition, is one of the um, largest markets in, 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 in Latin America. Is is the market that is producing more electricity per, per uh, capita in, 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 in the region, or with more than 30% of share of, of uh, uh, wind power in the energy mix. By far uh, away of, of 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 the largest markets, it's Brazil and, and Mexico, but uh, the Uruguayan system is, is is on top with with uh, with renewable energies and and needs to sort out some uh, uh, regional integration solutions in order to to keep uh, growing in the next years. 
Peru, despite uh, in 2018, has, um, has uh, put into operation some 280 megawatts, something like that. This year is, is zero megawatts. Peru is um, somehow analyzing uh, a way of uh, delivering more renewable energies, but there are no policy uh, final decisions in, in that sense. And, and there's a market that, that is uh, clearly asking for a regulatory push in order to to uh, to see a stable growth in, in in it in Central America we have seen only two, 22 megawatts in uh, this year in in Costa Rica uh, probably next year we will see some more uh, megawatts in Panama that are already being uh, constructed and uh, some regulatory changes are as well going on in Costa Rica that they are promising um, smaller amounts of, 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 of wind power in, in the Central America region. And uh, this year as well, the, the good news was the, the, um, the installed capacity in the Caribbean with uh, Republica Dominicana with 182 megawatts. Uh, that is going to continue next year with probably some more 60 to 80 megawatts that are under construction at that stage in 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 Dominican Republic, so uh, the picture for for 2020 is uh, really not easy to to figure out, but we think that the figures can be in between 3.5 3.7 um, uh, gigawatts, as uh, not very far away of what uh, was happening this year. And and this is uh, this is all. I will leave the floor. Or thing. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ramon, for the presentation. Uh, just a reminder, if anyone has any burning questions about um, the 2019 data in Latin America or any of the regulatory policy issues, please feel free to submit a question in the questions pane of your control panel, and we'll pick it up in the Q&A session after Fong's presentation. Um, Sorry, there we go. So Fung, we'll, we'll switch gears to look a bit further north to the US, um, looking at the impact of the US-China trade war on wind development, as well as the new uh, production tax credit extension that was just passed in, in the US, um, and also picking up the prospects for US offshore markets um, in the years to come. So I'll hand it over to you, Fung. Thank you, Alicia. Um, I'm going to spend five minutes to quickly go through what's going on in another part of America, but in a not um, different from the presentation that Ramon uh, gives, uh, where uh, in NATA uh, you got more than 15 sets of a market to go through. But uh, so the job for me is relatively easier because there are only two big markets in North America. Um, no doubt about. Uh, the U.S. is absolutely crucial for a global uh, wind market growth. Um, at the end of 2019, uh, even before, uh, U.S. has uh, become uh, the second largest market in the world after China uh, in terms of both new installations and also cumulative installation. In 2019, uh, we got data, actually Avia also organized a webinar uh, last week um, to disclose the statistics for Q4, uh, in the same time, uh, release the full year figures. Uh, it indicates last year in the US, uh, 9,143 megawatts has been built. Uh, this is not including this uh, uh, partial repowering, so it's mainly for green cell. Uh, slightly um, lower than most of the institution and the consulting firms believe, I think most of the case, um, everyone believes that uh, 2019 will be double digital gigawatt, uh, like more than 10 gigawatt. Uh, however, uh, the numbers indicate uh, only 9.1 gigawatt, but not bad because 9.3, oh, sorry, 9.1 gigawatt still make 2019 the third strongest year in American wind industry uh, um, history. 
So um, the the growth we can see uh, in 2019 uh, on top of uh, 2018 is mainly driven by uh, what we call the PTC phase out. Um, if you follow the market closely in the U.S., uh, the market is really uh, you know driven by PTC. It's a roller coaster market. Uh, you, when PTC switch on, you will see a lot of inflation. When it's gone, uh, you will see the clock, the market. That's that's how you can see from this slide. 2013, there is the cliff, um, completely uh, sharp contraction uh, compared with the uh, 2012. So um, the current installation, uh, we all know, um, start from actually uh, uh, the, the end of 2015 and beginning of 2016, when PTC uh, phase out uh, has been uh, launched by uh, the U.S. Senate, uh, the bill has passed, also followed by uh, what we call the IRS safe harbor rules, which means project um, start construction um, before the end of 2016. Um, then it will allow four years um, time to get the project built. So that means to quality, to capitalize the 100 percent of PTC. Um, project need to be completely uh, in commission um, by the end of 2020. That's why uh, we saw here, actually, uh, according to Avia uh, data, by the end of 2019, uh, we have project pipeline around 44 gigawatt um, out there. Out of this 40, uh, 44 gigawatt, um, half of that actually. 22 gigawatt is under construction. Another half is in different stage of the development. So you can see uh, um, this uh, project under construction, the figure 22 gigawatt, um, simply explain why we, we believe that um, 2020 will be another rush. Actually, uh, it will actually have a, a even better uh, outlook. So far, uh, most of the uh, institution, including uh, Avia uh, believes that uh, 2020 will probably close out around 14 or something around 14 and 15 gigawatt. Uh, our initial um, forecast here, we 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 stay at 15 gigawatt, but uh, we, we may um, give the final review when we are uh, working out our five years forecast in the end of um, uh, March in our Global Wind Report. Um, I would like to highlight here is that even though uh, the PTC um, phase out plan um, confirmed uh, in the end of 2015 already provided uh, clearly visibility in terms of the market growth for the U.S., we know there will be a rush in 2019 and 2020, and there will be a, a little bit more to be built in 2021 because project. Um, to be collected um, by the end of 2021, still, uh, you know, still possible to qualify this 80% of PTC. Uh, then uh, follow the previous plan. Uh, 2023 will be the last year where where we expect uh, the PTC impact will completely uh, disappear. Um, surprisingly, uh, by the end of uh, December, last year, actually, it's 19 you know, December, uh, US Congress passed a, a, a pending and tax bill. Uh, in fact, that uh, will extend the current PTC um, for another year. So, which means uh, project start construction uh, this year, 2020, or before the, the end of 2020, they will be allowed. Uh, to have four years uh, safe harbor construction time, which means if they can bring the project online by the end of 2024, they will get 60% uh, um, of PTC value. Uh, considering you know the the continuous drop of LCOE larger uh, turbine model introduced uh, to the entry market with the larger rotor size, um, so this actually 
uh, 60% PPC, which means will still drive a lot of new installation. That's why we believe that uh, follow this uh, uh, one year PPC extension, um, probably we will see around something around uh, five gigawatt extra to be built uh, on our Q3 um, forecast released by GWF uh, last September. So this means that uh, in 2024, probably we will see about so 10 gigawatt to be built. Uh, to be clear, this uh, 10 gigawatt um, new installation in 2024, including the offshore. Um, right now, we don't uh, in 2020, uh, 2019, we don't have any offshore uh, new project built online. Uh, however, this is uh, a strong pipeline. And for offshore, um, even though the the lobby has been done uh, quite significantly, and Avia, together with the big stakeholders uh, from the U.S. industry, uh, had the several meetings with the senator. Uh, however, um, they can. Uh, the final um, announcement do not including a long-term extension of the ITC for offshore. Um, so they only got one one year extra for for, for offshore. Uh, even though um, there is no long-term extension for ITC, however, the situation uh, actually for offshore is look actually uh, quite positive. Uh, next slide, Alicia. Thank you. Sorry about the animation, it should be there uh, while I'm talking. So here we are. So regarding the offshore, uh, we believe that there, there is a strong growth for offshore wind uh, in the horizon. Um, the, our confidence is mainly based on two uh, layer. Uh, layer one is about the uh, bone um, part of uh, the, um, the US uh, internal. Uh, department, uh, they they have already completed 15 uh, active commercial leasing uh, in the U.S. Uh, OST. So, uh, looking at the the, the first map uh, on the left side, where you can see we have this auction uh, leasing activity going on uh, around the uh, east coast, um, on the top from uh, Massachusetts uh, down to uh, North Carolina, uh, in total, this 15 leasing um, could actually uh, generate, um, provide the uh, possibility um, to get more than 21 gigawatt offshore built. Uh, then on the second layer, that's uh, mainly the growth, um, the positive uh, signal from the state level. On the state level, um, 2019, we kept saying positive news around, for example, uh, New York and New Jersey, uh, both states had uh, uh, upgraded their forecasts. Um, previously, they have 2020, uh, sorry, they have the 2030 uh, target for, for offshore wind. Uh, in New York, uh, previously, they are talking about 2.4 gigawatt by 2030. And then they increase to 9 gigawatt um, by 2020, uh, 20, 2035. Uh, the same in New Jersey. Um, the, the governor, uh, the state upgrade the target from 3.5 in 2030 uh, up to 7.5 gigawatt. Um, on top of that, where we can see uh, actually in 2019, um, another two states. Uh, Connecticut and uh, Maryland, both states uh, launched their uh, offshore uh, target. So in total, uh, at the end of 2019, um, uh, in the U.S., um, so they are about 25 gigawatt, 25.4 uh, gigawatt uh, target out there. Uh, so this uh, indicates uh, our strong growth. A year ago, in 2018, uh, by the end of 2018, we only see 9.1 gigawatt target out there. But after 12 months, then the figures um, 
has been more than double, uh, reaching to 25.4 gigawatt. That's uh, uh, quite significant. Uh, from the, the pie chart, you can see two states are taking the lead, uh, New Jersey and New York. Um, so uh, regarding uh, looking at the pipeline, um, so we know a lot of work uh, need to be built, uh, a lot of projects are going to be built in those states. But in terms of the uh, project execution or implement, um, let's take a look in the next slide. Here, um, where you can see, um, according to Avia and also the numbers provided by Bowen, uh, they are about 26 gigawatt offshore in the pipeline. Um, in our GUI market intelligence um, um, database, uh, we do track the project uh, one by one, uh, where uh, we can see so far out of this uh, 26 gigawatt pipeline, they are actually uh, 15 projects have been uh, announced um, by the project developer in terms of the commission year. Um, so we, we have aggregated the data um, for those uh, based on the numbers um, from those 15 projects. Uh, totally, uh, they are slightly over 10 gigawatt. So that's quite impressive. I mean, past the 10 gigawatt milestone where you can see uh, if the project developer can follow the schedule uh, as they plan uh, out for uh, up to 2026, uh, 10 gigawatt that's actually amazing because uh, so far uh, at the end of 2019, uh, as all we know, there are only one small commercial project um, in the US order. That's the 30 megawatt um, block island project uh, using um, previously GER stone um, turbine. So uh, looking at this 10 gigawatt pipeline, uh, where we can see um, from the chart, Upper, uh, upper Slay, Virginia, uh, and New York, they are taking the lead. Um, this, is, this just reflects the, the target because both states, they have the, um, more um, ambitious after target uh, than the rest of the uh, states along the East Coast. Um, regarding this uh, project ownership, um, uh, out of this 10 gigawatts pipeline um, in the US uh, offshore market, um, more than 70% of this uh, project actually uh, supposed to be delivered uh, in terms of project ownership action is controlled by the European uh, developer. Um, look at who they are. It's not a surprise. Uh, the Danish utility also is taking the lead. Uh, so 25 out of this 10 gigawatt, uh, one, uh, one force uh, is actually controlled by Oster. Uh, followed by uh, Arangri Renewable, that's the uh, subsidiary of the Spanish utility Ibedrona. Uh, then you can see some other European uh, company names, including the two offshore oil and gas company, Ukraine and Shell, both companies are very active uh, recently in offshore market, especially Ukraine, uh, they just win this uh, 3.6 gigawatt uh, options from the uh, UK safety. Um, so also you can see uh, Copenhagen uh, infrastructure and also EDPR, they have the, uh, the ownership in uh, the project pipeline, which is supposed to be built by uh, 2026. So in general, uh, so looking at the growth, uh, we believe that uh, the U.S. offshore market um, will take off, start from 2023. Uh, that will be the year uh, more than one gigawatt um, new installation will be um, built. And then followed by 2024 and 2025, actually the numbers are looking uh, really, really uh, impressive. Uh, 2024, uh, more than 3.5 and 2025, nearly four gigawatt. This absolutely will, uh, you know, create a stable growth uh, where, which will help the US industry or the state to build a new emerging industry. That's all the states they are aiming for. That's why we, 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 we saw uh, the 
the cumulative uh, offshore target has been upgraded from 8.9, uh, 8.1 in 2018 up to 25.4 gigawatt. Uh, in regard to the growth after 2024, even though so far um, we only have 880 megawatts for 2026, um, however, this do not uh, give uh, the firm answer for 2026 because uh, on top of the 10 gigawatt, this uh, 15 gigawatt, uh, 15 um, project, we ha we have actually a longer list of a project which has uh, already got the leasing contract uh, with Bond, and some project has uh, um, come out with with uh, the project plan, even though. Uh, exactly schedule hasn't been, been announced, but we believe that uh, there will be more than um, 20 gigawatt to be built um, in the next 10 years up to 20, 2030. Regarding the specific forecast um, for the US market, uh, we are going to provide the final forecast uh, in our global wind report to be released uh, end of March. Um, please follow us on the detail. I think that's the uh, general overview about uh, what's going on in the US, it's worth to pay attention. Uh, my, my last point regarding the title, um, Anisha mentioned that uh, on top of the PTC impact, um, the US trade or also have the impact for this uh, installation. It is true. Uh, if uh, uh, you follow our GWAC uh, supply chain report uh, for Gearbox, or that's a new report uh, we released before Christmas. You can see due to the, the this U.S. trade war, uh, the three leading gearbox suppliers, uh, NGC, uh, Winergy, and ZF, they have to manage uh, their internal resources, especially for the two European companies, because they have the facility not just in China, they have facility in the U.S. and somewhere else uh, in, in Europe, so they can they can um, reallocate the production capacity in uh, in Europe and also in, in India to support the US. But for companies like NGC, that's really, really a, a negative impact because US in the US market, uh, GE is a, a big client of NGC. Uh, due to the potential increase of the fitting tariff, uh, NGC have to think about doing something out of China. That's why they announced the plan to build a new factory in India in order to uh, accommodate uh, the, the challenge and to help their client G in the US. Uh, so um, Gearbox, that's, that's one thing, and also towers, that's another. Before the trade war, actually, uh, the, the tariff on top of the uh, the towers built not just in China, in Vietnam, Indonesia, um, has been the issue over there. So any increase of the tariff on top of the towers, that's no doubt will be the negative impact in terms of the LCOE, LCOE delivery. So the execution, uh, ex the execution cost uh, went up um, quite significantly in 2018, that issue has already been addressed uh, at the, the GWAC organized uh, event in Beijing, Beijing Renewable Investment Summit. We have the new Vista CEO, we have our CEO, and also a couple of uh, uh, developers um, went to the stage and made the comment regarding the negative impact. Because right now, uh, the, the, trade, the, the, the tariff, the, the trade wall hasn't been settled yet, which means uh, the impact a negative impact is still there. Uh, now, 2020, we, we believe that more gigawatts will be built. So therefore, it will certainly um, bring the concern for turbine OEMs in terms of the component right, right, uh, right here at reasonable cost and on time. And also for the developer, uh, it will decide if they can get uh, what they plan to to build um, to con. Uh, to capitalize the the full PTC by the end of uh, this year. So in general, we're going to um, watch this market um, closely. My last point here is regarding the ongoing coronavirus uh, in China. Uh, we all know, uh, you know, the U.S. market uh, has been dominant so far, start from five years ago, by three key players. 
um, that's GE, that's a local developer, Vista, OEMs, HGRE. Um, if you take a look at the Avia statistic, we have uh, another smaller player that's uh, Nordic actor owner. Uh, even though there is no Chinese turbine OEMs um, install um, a lot of turbine in the US, but your Chinese market actually is the hub in terms of a component um, delivery. So um, right now, you know, many cities has uh, been locked down um, due to this virus. So we don't know when this situation will change. So uh, that's why um, the leading turbine OEM start thinking about alternative solution if this will continue. Uh, this uh, absolutely uh, a negative uh, message um, for the for the U.S. industry. Well, that may put this 15 gigawatt target, uh, you know, uh, under the risk. Uh, we will look at what the situation uh, look like, and then we will provide the, the further forecast and update in our um, global wind report uh, release uh, in March. Thank you, thank you, Alicia. Thank you so much, Fang, for that super interesting presentation. Uh, we're running a bit short on time for the Q&A, so I think I'll just wrap it up there. And for everyone who submitted a question, uh, I'll follow up via email um, with some answers. So don't worry, your questions will be answered. Uh, I would just like to draw your attention. Uh, so this was the America's data release. Um, uh, we'll be doing a release uh, every day, uh, every sorry, every week from now until the lead up to the launch of our global wind report. Uh, so next week, uh, there's a typo there, should be the 11th, 11th of February. We'll be releasing Africa and Middle East, followed by Asia Pacific, moving on to global offshore, um, then our global overview, and then finally the launch of our global wind report 2019, which will bring everything together and um, analyze the, the biggest trends, challenges, and opportunities for wind um, in emerging markets globally. Uh, thank you for tuning in for today's uh, webinar. Um, you'll receive a follow-up email within 24 hours with a link to view the recording of today's webinar. Um, as I said, if you submitted a question, we'll follow up via email. Um, on behalf of GWEC, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of the day.